for joining today's webinar. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. Um, but if you'd like to introduce yourselves in the chat box, you can um, do it in that box and send through any questions or comments you have there uh, throughout the webinar. And we'll get started in just a minute. today's webinar. Um, it's called Protection Strategies, What We Know So Far. Um, this was the beginning introduction uh, to an online discussion forum following this webinar that will go for the next four weeks. So we hope that you're all able to join and attend on that. Um, just a few background things on the webinar. Due to the large number of participants, um, we've muted your microphones, but you can send through messages on the chat box for the group to see. Um, or the question and answer, if you have any technical difficulties, I can reach you there. Um, feel free to comment and ask questions throughout the webinar, and we'll try to answer those at the end. And um, you can also bring in any remaining questions into the online discussion forum over the next few weeks. Um, so I'll hand it over to Jessica to get started. Great. Hello, everyone. Um, just like to introduce myself. So I'm Jessica Lenz. I'm the Senior Program Manager for Protection at Interaction. And I lead on the results-based protection program here um, at Interaction. Um, and who was just speaking was Eileen McCarthy, who's our protection co or program coordinator. Um, so as many of you know, we've been doing a series of online discussion forums. Um, this is our third. Um, and so we, most of the time, we launch these with a webinar to kind of set the background or the stage um, before we get into a more virtual conversation over the next couple of weeks. Um, sometimes in the past, we've had um, guest speakers um, that start the webinar. In this case, we are presenting some findings from some of the desk review and interviews that we've been carrying out over the last couple of weeks. Um, so with that, I'll kind of give some background in terms of the results-based protection program and then get into more of the substance of what some of the findings are for this particular webinar. So the results-based protection program um, is funded by USCID and ECHO, um, and it's been going on since 2012. Um, and I'll talk about some of the different uh, initiatives that we've been doing to understand and shape um, the key elements for results-based protection. But just to start us off, when we say results-based protection, I have, I have up on the screen what we're talking about. So I will read this to you so you can see this. So results-based protection refers to results as the measurable components of an intervention that contribute to and include the outcome or impact intended or unintended, positive or negative, of the response. And so outcome is measured in terms of reduced risk. So that's just to give you um, a base for what we're talking about as it relates to results-based protection. What we've been doing for this program since 2012 is we've had a number of different initiatives that have helped us identify some of the key elements that support a results-based approach to protection. So in 2012, we had a call for examples where we asked um, different individuals, different agencies to send in examples uh, from their own programs, um, tools, methods, um, reports that they felt um, highlighted key elements of results-based protection. We also have carried out a number of stakeholder consultations. Um, in 2013, we held a practitioner's roundtable here in Washington, D.C. to discuss some of those findings and to move us into the second phase um, of this program, which is more validating some of those elements and getting ready to test um, what we've identified. Um, we also have created a learning and steering group. Um, this is made up of six NGOs. Um, who have been helping us, guide us, and advise us on some of the activities and the findings that we've 
identified so far. In addition to that, we've carried out two um, in-country practitioner roundtables. One was in Myanmar last year, and just recently we were in Lebanon. And both of those had specific um, objectives in mind. So in Myanmar, we were looking at protection analysis, and in Lebanon, we were looking at program design specifically. And this particular webinar that we're, we're about to do and the, the discussion on protection strategy, we will have an additional in-country roundtable in August um, with the country not decided at this point, but we'll be focusing on protection strategy. Um, and then the last really core activity that this program has been working on is our series of webinars and online discussions. Um, as, as I said before, we this is our third one in the beginning or the end of last year, sorry, we had one on designing for results. Um, and then just in January, we had one looking at communicating with communities and really looking at the flow of information between affected populations and different stakeholders. So let us move on to where we are today. Um, so we're, today we're really looking at and trying to understand protection strategies. So the results-based protection program is, is, take, is looking through the program cycle and trying to identify the key elements and the results that are necessary throughout the program cycle to lead to um, protection outcomes. So we're really now at the stage of protection strategy. So our core objectives for this um, piece, for both the webinar and um, the discussion forum, is to review whether and how current approaches to protection strategies support a results-based approach to protection. And second is to identify the critical components within a protection strategy that are necessary to achieve a protection outcome. By the end of this discussion forum, so the four weeks, we expect to have a summary and an analysis paper. So we produce these after each discussion forum. Um, and this is, allows us to critically analyze the discussions and examples that are coming out both within the webinars and also in the, the discussion, the online discussion. Um, the other ones that we have done are on our website and you can, you can review those to see some of the key findings that are coming out of program design, for example, um, and communicating with communities. So the same will be done with this uh, webinar. The second um, output for this, um, for really looking at protection strategy, is then to help us inform the in-country roundtable that we will have in August. So what we find in this virtual discussion um, and through the, the interviews that we've been doing um, will help us shape the, the agenda and, and kind of the core work that we'll do on the ground in August. So the methodology that we've been using to really explore protection strategy is basically in five different steps. So we've started off doing a desk review. We've reviewed several different protection strategies, and we're still in the process of reviewing strategies. It's, it's, it hasn't ended at this point. We've also been carrying out interviews, and I'll talk a little bit more in just a minute about who we've interviewed so far. Um, this is not exhaustive as of yet, but it's, it's where we are at the, at the moment in, in looking at uh, protection strategies. Um, we are just now, today, starting the four-week online discussion, and this will hopefully allow us to gather content and examples from people around the world that we may not have an ability to actually speak to you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, as part of this four-week online discussion, we will also be having a series of guest speaker webinars throughout the discussion forum. So as much as you're speaking virtually, um, about every week or every four, three to four days, we will have a guest speaker lined up to present some of the that are thinking around protection strategies, and hopefully that will help shape the conversation that's happening virtually. And then lastly, um, as I said, we will be going to the field in August um, and um, shaping protection strategy a little bit more and grounding it um, in, in the field, so through an in-country practitioner's roundtable. So where we are and what we've done so far in terms of um, looking at protection strategies. So we have carried out 15 different interviews with um, eight N I NGOs. We've had two country-specific NGO coordination bodies that we've also spoken to, and we are in the process of speaking to PROCAP officers. And as I said, this is um, our first 
uh, step in interviews, we haven't exhausted um, this list. This is just where we are at the moment. So there is possibility to speak to other um, actors, including coordinators, um, uh, within the uh, protection, GBV, child protection field. Um, to date, in terms of where these individuals have been located and, and what they've spoken to, um, they've looked at the Democratic Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, Lebanon, Nigeria, and South Sudan. So those are the particular protection strategies um, that we've been able to um, look at ourselves, but also um, speak to actors on the ground who've been engaged in those particular protection strategies. Our desk review at this point in time has mostly consisted of HCT protection strategies, and so we've been able to look at South Sudan, Nigeria, and the Central African Republic. So just to give you a bit of scope in terms of where we are and what we're actually looking at when we've been carrying out the interviews um, and as we've been looking through the different strategies as part of the desk review. We've, we've taken a, a process to look at seven particular areas. Um, so we have key questions that revolve around these seven areas. So I'll just go through them so you have a general idea about what these actually mean. So the first one is really looking at process. And in process, we're, we're focused in on looking at the coordination aspects of how a protection strategy comes about, um, looking at ownership. So is there a sense of ownership? Um, what does that look like? Who's involved in that? Who are the different stakeholders that are engaging um, in the development of a protection strategy? What are the time frames um, in putting together a protection strategy? Um, and also, what is the methodology? What does that actually look like? Um, what was the process of putting? Was it a one-off meeting? Was it at several workshops? Um, so really just looking at the overall process of putting it together. Two is looking at content and the coverage. So how was the strategy articulated in terms of outcome-oriented direction, or was it more focused on outputs or activities? Um, also within this, we're looking at the full coverage. So does the coverage look at both prevention and response? Um, and as it relates to looking at protection policy, um, service delivery or operations, are those both considered within the strategy? The third is looking at analysis, so the protection analysis. So what grounded or what was the underlying foundation um, for the protection strategy. So was it based on an actual analysis that explored threat, vulnerability, and capacity? Or where did that protection strategy originate from? So really talking to actors about what did that, what did that look like and how did that feed in? The fourth um, is then looking at the causal logic behind the strategy. So as much as there was an analysis, was there discussion about whether or not there is a theory of change that underpins the response. And if there is, how was that articulated? How was that um, put together from the different actors in the room? How did, it, how did an agreement come about if there was a theory of change behind it? Number five is then looking at the contribution of relevant actors. So aside from those actors in the room, um, who are developing the strategy, um, were other actors identified within the protection strategy to respond to a protection issue in order to achieve a protection outcome? So how was the contribution articulated, and was that also included within um, the, the theory of change um, of the, the strategy? The sixth, then, is looking at accountability. So if um, the strategy is well articulated, um, are we holding actors accountable who we've identified within the strategy who would contribute to the reduction of a particular risk? So what does accountability look like? Um, what is the process for that? Um, so really asking different individuals about how would we go about that um, and what would be the steps needed to, um, to look at um, accountable, holding ourselves accountable. Now the seventh key piece of our review um, has been focused on the role of humanitarians to address the threat. And this, I would say, is actually comes out of uh, really looking at analysis, 
um, and also very much ties into our causal logic behind the response and then obviously the contribution of relevant actors. Um, but we found that there was a need to, to discuss and explore a little bit about where humanitarians felt their role was to address the threat. So if they did not feel like there was a role, um, then would that play out in the analysis and then, and then the causal logic behind the protection strategy? Um, and if they did, was that articulated as well? So we did want to explore a little bit about what the role of humanitarians were. So that's the scope um, of what we focused on. Um, so let's move on. So just to give you a starting place um, in terms of what we've been, in terms of how we've been defining protection strategy at this stage. Um, and this is not a formal definition. Um, this is just the term that we've been using um, for the purpose of our consultations. So by the end of this series of consultations, interviews, the discussion forum, and our, um, con our in-country consultations roundtable, um, hopefully we will have a more defined protection in terms of what we mean by protection strategy as it relates to results-based protection. But at this stage, um, just to set the groundwork, this is what we're, we're meaning. So a protection strategy refers to a combination of efforts often involving multiple actors and sectors to bring about a desired protection outcome. A strategy is larger than a program. It should inform and be informed by a comprehensive set of efforts working towards a common desired outcome. And therefore, when we talk about a protection, or sorry, a strategic planning, strategic planning for protection, we're meaning the process of articulating the desired protection outcome or outcomes articulating the pathway or causal logic to achieve it, setting out clearly defined corresponding objectives and indicators, and describing the complementary uh, roles of the actors contributing to the desired outcome. Okay, so what we've identified in, in starting to do these uh, interviews at this stage is we've, we've recognized that there are four levels of protection strategy development. And we have been exploring all four, um, some at a greater level than others. Um, but one, you may find a protection strategy being developed at an organizational level. So how an organization puts together its own protection strategy and what's the process for that. Um, and if it differs from when you're engaging at an interagency level. The second is then a protection strategy that might be developed between two or more organizations. So it's not comprehensive of all actors, perhaps in a cluster, um, but just two um, or three organizations coming together around a particular issue. The third level was then looking at protection uh, strategies that were developed at the cluster level, um, and this would include the child protection working groups, the GBV, um, uh, mine action and HLP. Um, and this would be where those clusters are developing a strategy that then may feed into a strategic response plan um, or at a higher level. The fourth level of protection uh, develop, strategy development was then looking at the humanitarian country team protection strategies. So where there was really at, at a very top senior level and driven um, by the HCT that a, protect, a protection strategy was needed. Um, and so what did that look like? So now I'm gonna get to the findings and, it, and it's quite extensive findings. Um, and I'm sorry that there isn't another person here to kind of go back and forth. So you will hear a lot of me uh, <laughs> going through each of these, these findings, but hopefully this sets the stage. Um, in launching us into the discussion forum over the next four weeks. Um, what we'd like to say, though, in starting this, in terms of the findings, this is not um, our conclusion. That we haven't um, analyzed this to the extent where we, where we have come up with um, what is next for results-based protection. This is really what individuals that we've been interviewing have said so far. Um, and it's where we want to start the discussion and hopefully through this discussion, especially a lot of the, the findings that we've found are, are uh, quite a number of challenges. So what we do hope to do um, once the discussion starts is to really think about how do we 
how do we visualize what we want? How do we actually get to achieving a protection strategy that will re, um, lend us to achieving a protection outcome? Um, so really think of this as kind of the, the base, the foundation, um, and then help us shape it to what we actually need. So I'm going to go through those seven different areas of focus that we've been that we looked at in order to describe um, the findings so far. So let's start off with process and look at some of the key pieces of process that came out. So the first finding, differing views and understanding on what a protection strategy is or should be creates confusion and an inability to effectively engage in strategic planning processes. For local organizations, the barriers to participation are even higher. So what we found here in during, during the interviews is that multiple actors that we've been interviewing had a very different understanding or starting point about what a protection strategy was, who it was for, and who should participate in the development of this. There was uh, a confusion sometimes, or even mixing of terminology in terms of a roadmap or that it was a strategic vision, to the point where some really looked at it as just an action plan um, and what the process should be to go into it. Um, in addition to this, what we also found is that, particularly when it came to national um, or local organizations, it wasn't simply that they didn't understand what a protection strategy was or the process to develop it, but at the very start, they often lacked the capacity or the knowledge to even understand our system, the humanitarian system, to be able to even engage effectively in, um, in the, the development of a protection strategy. And sometimes this also would include INGO staff, um, UN staff, different government agencies. So, that limited their engagement and experience in developing a protection strategy. Second finding is effective coordination is fundamental for developing a protection strategy. So this was, I think, reiterated over and over and over again, almost among all of the the individuals that we have interviewed so far, um, that it really you really need to have a strong coordinator and coordination in place in order for a strategy to even come about. What we found, though, is that most of the, the things that people brought out in the interviews were challenges with coordination. Um, we found that there was quite um, uh, limited and weak skills on facilitating a protection strategy um, so that, that didn't exist um, or there wasn't knowledge about how to go about um, a protection strategy or the development of it. As part of this, um, particularly as it relates to who is at the table and engaging, there did seem to be a lot of uh, poor relationship building. So the efforts weren't there or they weren't in place to develop relationships um, with different stakeholders to engage them in the process. We also found that there was quite a lot of limited resources, both human resources and financial resources dedicated to the protection strategy development process. Um, this included time. So oftentimes we would see these very quick turnovers, uh, 48 hours sometimes needing feedback or input um, without allowing the space um, to really develop a, a strategy in order to engage other actors to be able to contribute effectively. Um, and there was also very little training um, for coordinators or other actors to, uh, on, on how to go about um, a protection strategy. Another key piece for this in terms of coordination that um, definitely was reiterated several times was a need for a dedicated role um, for somebody to actually um, engage and, and uh, facilitate a protection strategy. What we found is that the coordinator often had a triple hat or a double hat, so that they were they were representing another agency, um, or that they were trying to manage um, other di dynamics within um, within their own role and the other role that they were playing. And so this triple hatting um, not only fueled the various power dynamics, 
but it also undermined the collective ownership of the protection strategy as it started to, de to develop. Um, and, and, and a third kind of point here is when there was no dedicated role, there was then very limited time and resources de dedicated to, um, to that person or to be able to facilitate that process. So their resources were being pulled elsewhere um, versus actually um, the process of developing a strategy. Um, in addition, what we found is that the coordination often was quite siloed. So you may have at the protection cluster level um, a protection strategy being developed and then you would have one in the GBV working groups and the child protection groups, um, but those were not coming together. Um, so there were quite a lot of gaps and oftentimes duplication. Um, and so it really had to do with the coordination element in terms of whether or not um, those different actors were uh, working together in a, in a way that could feed each other, feed off of each other's um, work in both in terms of analysis and developing the strategy. Uh, in addition to this, coordination did seem to, uh, a, a key piece of coordination was communication. So as much as it was about building relationships, it was also about fostering um, a solid amount of communication to, in, to inform um, and build trust and transparency um, around a protection strategy. Um, and lastly here, um, what we also found is that if coordinators felt disempowered, they could not effectively steer the process or voice protection priorities upwards. So there was um, a need for the coordinator themselves to actually be able to have some type of a voice or leadership um, in order to be able to push decisions. So a third finding, limited consultative process undermines the credibility and uptake of a protection strategy. So again, this went back to whether or not certain actors were at the table, um, who was there um, engaging and informing the process. Um, it also meant that in terms of what that consultative process looked like, was it a meeting, was it informal, was it formal, um, or was it a more workshop format um, in, in order to allow particular input to be, to be brought in. We also identified that there was little pre-workshop planning, so this was very ad hoc most of the time, so there was limit, limited in terms of structure, key questions, and the facilitation of the stakeholders was also um, lacking. Um, consultation also meant timing, so whether or not there was enough time for feedback and input into the process, and that um, led to whether or not it was quality feedback and also quality engagement. Discussions, in addition, focused on more broad or dominated by particular actors um, or perhaps um, agency-driven agendas versus a discussion that really was built around um, an analysis. Um, in addition, in terms of that consultative process, um, again, as I mentioned earlier, whether or not there was capacity in the room to understand um, what a protection strategy was and that that limited engagement overall. So a fourth finding on process was then strategy development is often driven from the top rather than building from the ground up limiting the involvement and sense of ownership at the field level and among those implementing programs. So what we found through um, the interviews thus far was that many of the strategies were built and driven by agency mandates um, in terms of the discussion and, and the content. Um, and therefore, it was really, it started at the top versus actually being built from communities or those that were actually engaged with affected populations. Um, at, at times it was also, it could be driven by a donor um, or even just the cluster uh, process versus that there was a need for a strategy in the first place. Um, in addition, we also found that some protection strategies were written um, by outsiders um, or headquarters um, and then that started the process um, for engagement and very little engagement with those implementing programs themselves. So how to actually build from those on the ground who are actually engaged um, and to be able to shape, shape the, uh, a protection strategy and actually use it on a day-to-day -day basis. A 
fifth finding is that ad hoc methodological approaches and facilitation at the start of a planning process contribute to an unsuccessful protection strategy. So again, poor planning, a lack of skills, limited engagement on shaping the agenda and the methodology from the strategic planning process at the start actually led to um, poor results. Um, if there was no clear point about what the desire for external support or facilitation of the process was, um, or whether coordinators should be expected to carry this out. Um, there was definitely, uh, in terms of the interviews that were brought out, it was very personality driven. Um, so whether or not relationships were built or facilitation or, the, or even the issue of transparency um, had a lot to do with the actual person and their personality. Sixth was then strong leadership helps to mobilize a diverse set of actors to prioritize protection as an overarching goal of the humanitarian response. So what we found is that this actually doesn't exist in the majority of cases, but this is what actors were saying was needed. Um, we found that there were multiple UN agencies leading a response could sometimes create power dynamics or turf issues. Um, and duplication of um, activities or programs within a strategy. And then there was also serious gaps. So when leadership lacked, or when there were two or three leaders, um, there wasn't a cohesive and a comprehensive approach. And in addition, the leadership um, that was identified oftentimes didn't actually reflect the analysis on the ground and what was really happening, but sometimes it was a reflection of what the for example, the HC desired, whether or not it was something that the, even the protection cluster or other uh, working groups actually had prioritized. So sometimes this leadership would even shift and change the priorities recognized from the ground. The seventh finding under process then was there are examples of effective processes at an organizational level which may offer some lessons for interagency strategy and development. So although we, we did struggle finding some good examples at this point in looking at interagency, we, we were able to identify organizations that have um, identified methodologies, um, how to effectively engage different actors within their organization. So perhaps it was workshops that were carried out over several days. They were engaging field staff, for example, all the way down to their community mobilizers, volunteers even, in, to participate. Um, and that they use participatory techniques within the workshops um, to facilitate an open discussion. So we were able to identify some good examples that can perhaps help us learn um, and, and affect um, the protection strategy at an interagency level. So I'm going to move on now to content um, in terms of our findings and what we've identified um, in terms of co content and coverage. So the first is, it's unclear from recent protection strategies what prioritization is based off of. So what, we've, what we were able to conclude at this point were that priorities often come from multiple sources. They're derived from a list of what various stakeholders are, are already engaged in, and they're not necessarily driven from a protection analysis. Um, priorities that um, go up to the HC from a protection cluster can sometimes be reshaped or rejected, um, and alternative priorities can be imposed. In addition, priorities are not ba based off of a comprehensive analysis, and they're often based off of assumptions um, and what agencies feel that they can do or cannot um, be done. Second, under content and coverage, protection strategies have become really a laundry list of activities driven by agency mandates, organizational models, and services that donors fund. These activities may have little to do with the reality on the ground. So again, not based off of a protection analysis, really a list of activities, um, and oftentimes uh, focused on quantity over the quality um, of one or two initiatives, um, and very much heavy on outputs versus outcomes. A third finding was protection strategies have become everything uh, without achieving anything. 
So often strategies cover, they really do, they cover everything with no articulation of the geographical coverage, no timelines necessarily put down. Um, they can be very broad in general with no real clear direction and sometimes not based on the reality. Um, or what we found is that it could focus on only one or two areas, um, perhaps on, in a ge geographical location, um, because that's where everybody is, or that's where everyone has access to, and other geographic locations and populations are left out. The fourth uh, finding for coverage and content was looking at the service delivery and setting up of systems, um, for example, referral pathways, um, dominate most protection strategies with safe programming becoming the default for addressing risk. Little attention on prevention with advocacy, often cited as the main activity for stopping violations and abuse. So we did find that there was limited focus on prevention um, and identifying the roles and actions needed to reduce the violence and abuse. Um, humanitarians seem to turn inward and focus on safe programming, something they have control over, compared to external risks that populations may be experiencing because of the crisis. Um, advocacy is also not very clearly defined. Um, it's often seen as the responsibility of uh, the heads of UN or agencies or donor governments, um, but areas of negotiation, persuasion, or indirect or direct engagement with uh, different parties of the armed conflict, for example, are not necessarily informed um, or included in an advocacy strategy as part of the protection strategy. Um, in addition, there was quite a little bit um, focus on forecasting. So the strategy tended to focus on what's happening now or what happened in the past, but not really building on that to identify particular patterns of risk or scenario planning um, was, was pretty much rarely done if done, and if done was not very adequately done and given attention. A fifth finding was differing views about what a protection strategy is and should be creates a tangled output of plans, processes, and activities with little to no substance on the desired change and what results will lead to protection outcomes. So because there was no clear overarching goal and articulated path that describes how an issue will be addressed, protection strategies then tend to mix everything together. So they have pieces of an action plan, they have pieces of um, you know, a vision, um, sometimes describing who should be engaged, sometimes not, um, and sometimes even just listing the process um, over an, an actual strategy. And what we found in this section, there was actually an interesting question um, that was raised um, a couple of times, and so we thought that it would be good to raise it here for us to start thinking about um, when, we, when we talk about the development of a protection strategy and really trying to address particular protection issues. Um, and so, should a protection strategy be an open or confidential document? Does this determine who is brought into the discussion and what issues are addressed? So please keep that in mind as we kind of go through this and, and as we start the discussion form over the next uh, four weeks. So let's move on to analysis. Um, very briefly. So what we've found is that strategies are not based on a comprehensive analysis. Little attention is given to the understanding of context-specific threats, vulnerabilities, and capacities. Again, they tend to be driven by activities that are already undergoing, or agency mandates, or even organizational models um, of a particular um, issue, or what donors will fund. They are not, they tend not to focus on the historical and contextual analysis, so that is lacking. Um, staff has limited knowledge on the historical dynamics and context or drivers of a conflict, and also high staff turnover contribute to the lack of contextual understanding. Limited investment in identifying community self-protection mechanisms. So what we did find is that there was very little funding or interest even um, in looking at self-protection or community-based protection um, and how that feeds into the analysis. Um, and this was often overshadowed by vulnerability and risks and really understanding and recognizing the vulnerability, but little on understanding the coping mechanisms that the affected population was, was using. 
And lastly, for analysis, there are efforts um, at an organizational level to strengthen analysis. We have identified um, a couple of organizations that have been carrying out research, for example, um, on coping mechanisms, um, self-protection mechanisms, as well as um, identifying ways to do this. So looking at various methodologies, engaging protection committees to help identify um, community-based protection. So let's move to the fourth focus um, of our review, and that's looking at the causal logic um, or theory of change. So the finding, developing a context-specific theory of change may be useful in articulating assumptions and causal pathways to achieve protection outcomes. In addition, it may help to identify the contribution of actors outside the humanitarian system necessary to reduce risk. This process is a necessary but often neglected step in the development of a protection strategy. So we found from our interviews so far that it's rarely done. Um, some organizations do have examples um, where they are doing this internally um, and trying to look at a theory of change, but it's limited by the actors who are engaged with this. It's sometimes it is one, one person within an agency um, and not necessarily all of the different actors engaging, and certainly not, um, not including development actors or the affected population or civil society. In addition, in terms of developing a theory of change, um, it was noted that there was quite little time or space to, to even come together and to think through this. Um, and the second finding under, under this under the causal logic was the development of a theory of change can be influenced by several factors. Um, it can be influenced by donor priorities, agency mandates, organizational focus capacity, political agendas. So these factors may drive the formulation of a misguided pathway for change. Um, so what we found here is particularly that it wasn't context specific. So it could be an overarching theory of change for an organization, but have little effect in terms of how a population has experienced change over time. Um, it can also be driven by the wrong actors. So who are developing this and, and what's their theory behind the, the response? Um, and certainly not based off of historical uh, background as it relates to change. What we did find is the actors that did find that it was valuable and that it was needed um, but that it needed to be driven from the bottom up um, and be very context specific and not driven from the top. So let's move on to five. Um, so looking at the contribution by relevant actors. So the core finding that came out of, out of this area was that protection strategies do not go far enough in articulating who and what is needed to bring about a protection outcome. The contribution of stakeholders to respond to protection issues is often limited to who participates in a protection cluster or working group and how the discussion is facilitated. So we did see some attempts to engage local actors, but as I said earlier, um, many times the local actors lacked the capacity to engage um, or they didn't feel like they had a voice to engage in the process. Um, the strategy does not articulate the need for other actors to engage in the response, nor does it articulate who those actors are. So the strategy tends to be limited to protection actors or those that are actually um, engaging in the discussions. And what we found interesting is that the question of who should help to address this protection issue is oftentimes never even asked. Um, so it really relies on those in the room versus looking outside um, looking at development actors or civil society or others to address it. So it's, if, if those questions aren't being asked, then it's not articulated in the strategy in the first place. So our sixth um, finding um, in looking at this review of opposing views on whether or not a protection strategy should be used as a means to hold actors expected to implement the strategy accountable. So what we found here is that we didn't have an agreement between um, the different actors that we interviewed. Um, some um, of the interviewees um, indicated that it was too difficult 
that there were so many different actors, different individuals or agencies and stakeholders who were responding that it was impossible to hold all of these actors accountable, um, especially when those different actors don't even participate in the groups. Um, then some interviews also inter emphasized the need for a strategy to be simple and practical. And so they, they felt like that the strategy should be something that they are able to use on a day-to-day -day basis or a weekly basis. But currently, most strategies that are developed, um, it's such a tedious process um, where most actors didn't feel it was even relevant into what they were doing or had a stake, that after it was done, it was put on a shelf and never looked at again until it was time to do a reporting out on that strategy. So it's not being used or even looked at on a regular basis. Um, some also felt that it could be a tool to help reflect on the response, but that it should not be a benchmark in terms of progress achieved. Whereas on the flip side, there were other interviewees who felt that no, we need accountability. We need something that we are striving for, that all of us can be held accountable um, and specifically hold um, leadership accountable um, in the actions that we've identified within the strategy. Um, others felt that if we had an accountability system, it would be better, uh, in terms of transparency, uh, this would be strengthened overall in terms of how a protection strategy um, was able to play out and who was actually, what the decisions were being made around that. But I think all of the actors or the inter interviewees that we engaged with um, indicated that a protection strategy needs to be flexible um, and it should be able to be adaptable and when crises change. Um, and so in terms of accountability, that may also shift as well. So our last uh, key area that we have been exploring is looking at the role of humanitarians to address threat. And I'm just going to put up two particular findings at this stage um, and not go into a great amount of detail. But what we have identified so far is how humanitarians perceive their role to reduce risk influences the analysis that drives the protection strategy. And this is, this is the starting point. So what we have seen, there are, very, there are differences in terms of how agencies um, understand whether or not they have a role if they should have an indirect role or they should have a direct role um, to address the threats. Um, and so what we're, we're doing now is exploring this a little bit further in terms of some of the examples and the, the challenges around this. Um, but this right now what I just want to bring out is that there is a huge variation across those who's, who have been interviewed in terms of what is their role. Okay, so that is where we um, come to in terms of our findings at this stage. Um, again, these are not, we haven't made any conclusions um, of what um, and how these shape a results-based approach to protection. This is simply the findings coming out of our interviews at this point. And for us, it's a, it's a time to be able to take these uh, different findings, the different challenges and issues that have been raised, and help us try to think differently and help us shape going forward and what would it take for us to achieve a protection strategy that was focused on protection outcomes. Um, and so at this point, I, I will um, take comments um, and questions in terms of clarity, um, not questions in terms of what we think at this stage since we have not come to any conclusions. But I just want to pass it over to Eileen to see if there were any questions or comments. Yeah, so we have one question about the selection criteria as far as countries were concerned. Um, so what informed the selection of those countries? Okay, so the first question about country criteria, um, there wasn't necessarily um, criteria. It was where we knew there were um, HCT protection strategies that had been developed. And so we were able to identify um, South Sudan, Yemen, Nigeria and the Central African Republic. We were not able to actually interview nor receive the protection strategy in Yemen, but the other, um, the other countries we were. So that started off in terms of the HCT protection strategy. In terms of the other countries 
um, in terms of really exploring those, that was based off of the eight of the individuals that we interviewed to date. Um, so we, we certainly sent out um, a number of requests, starting with the NGO community, um, who we know have engaged um, at different levels, sometimes at a global level and sometimes in countries, and what they were able to speak to. So whether they were part of um, a particular protection strategy in a particular country, they spoke to that, and sometimes they brought their learning from when they were in the field in another context, even though they may now be at a headquarter context. Um, so it wasn't that we set out to just look at those countries, it was really informed by the actors um, and where, where they were coming from and what they engaged on. Great, so another question we have is regarding the findings on process and the st protection strategies that were analyzed. Uh, were they developed by the protection cluster and the cluster V or another agency that took lead of the process, for example, OCHA? Oh, I see. Okay. Um, th this would vary um, depending on who we were interviewing um, and where what the context was. So at some times, the, the way it was led was led by a coordinator who might be representing that particular lead agency. So if it was at a protection um, working group level or cluster level, that could be led by the coordinator who may also be double hatting with UNHCR. If it was someone we were speaking to who was um, a GBV coordinator or a child protection coordinator, then it could have been um, double hatting in a sense with UNICEF or UNFPA. Um, but um, generally, that's where the leadership was within the coordination. Um, it was often driven by the coordinator. Um, to with the, the idea that a protection strategy needs to be developed. This, the way it originated, could have come from a request because of the development of the, the strategic response plan in SRP. So that could have then informed how that coordinator then started to lead on the process. Uh, we did also identify a couple of times where there were missions or um, outside or external um, groups who came into a particular uh, context um, who kind of oversaw and looked at the issues and went away and then indicated to the coordinator that a strategy was needed and therefore that triggered a response to start the development of the process to, to develop a protection strategy. Um, we didn't see very often where there was suddenly just a need um, to rally around a particular issue and start to develop a protection strategy, except in one case um, where a particular protection issue received such great media attention um, that it forced actors, UN actors, to come together around a particular issue. Um, and then that leadership was divided um, between three different UN leaders, um, and then that process led into the protection analysis which again wasn't necessarily comprehensive or in a way that uh, was collaborative to look at gaps and, and um, issues that needed to be addressed through both through all three of those leaders. So again, it was different um, in each different context in terms of how it was led um, and who participated. In, in some cases, there was an NGO um, co-lead as well as with the coordinator, um, and then and that helped shape things as well at times. Um, we have one more question. Uh, what is the success of safe programming in other countries? Um, at this point, we are not we were not reviewing the the success of safe programming. Um, it It was raised um, as it came out of the as in terms of what strategies, the content and what they covered. Um, in terms of the types of activities and programming that was being done. And so safe programming was certainly mentioned several times, but we weren't actually measuring the success of it. Okay, any last questions or comments? Okay, so now what we're gonna do, um, as I said, this again is just the starting point um, and what we need you now is to help us shape this discussion. So I'm going to let Eileen, um, who
who spoke earlier tell you how you can get involved? Um, so the best way to get involved in the discussion is through our online discussion over the next four weeks. Um, you can register online at the Results Based Protection online platform and the address is there for you. Um, and if you can also let me know, I can make sure that you're added to the group, but once you register, I can add you right to the Protection Strategy group. And on there, in a few hours, we'll be launching the forum um, with some introductory questions and comments, um, as well as the recording of this webinar. So feel free to engage and register um, and invite any colleagues that you might think it would be useful to engage in. Um, also, you can sign up for regular updates on our website. Um, so when you click the link there, um, you'll see the, the section to the right where you can sign up to get updates. Um, so things like event invitations for future webinars and discussion forums, as well as some supporting materials and findings that we um, that we have on results-based protection as the program goes forward. We'll also be having a series of webinars throughout this online discussion. So our first one is scheduled for this Wednesday at the same time uh, with Leah Kripchenya, um, and she will be speaking with us briefly. Um, we'll also have upcoming webinars, as Jessica mentioned at the beginning, over uh, every few days. Um, so we'll be sending out another announcement about those upcoming webinars. Okay, so again, this is your chance to help us shape this discussion. Um, you've heard a lot of the challenges um, and the findings coming out so far. So we're really hoping that you're able to, to provide perhaps examples that show us what does work. Um, and what does it take um, to actually um, shift our thinking in terms of really looking at protection outcomes and developing strategies, protection strategies that can inform um, a more results-based approach to protection. Um, so definitely join in um, and engage also on the series of uh, guest speakers over the next uh, couple of weeks. And we will, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, be analyzing all of the findings um, from both the webinars, the guest speakers, and the discussion, um, and then producing a report at the end, and that this will also inform our next field visit that will take place in August. So thank you all for joining, um, and this webinar will be, it is recorded and will be sent out to all of you, so please do forward it on to your colleagues who are not able to participate and invite them to engage in the discussion. Thank you.